Good morning. This is Jim Colburn of Commodity Research Group. I'm with Andy LeBeau, also of Commodity Research Group, and we're here to talk about energy markets. To learn more about us, you can check out our website, commodityresearchgroup.com, where we post our podcasts and our blog. We would like to thank our friends at EKT Interactive Oil and Gas Training for hosting this podcast. Check out their newsletters, podcasts, and learning modules at ektinteractive.com. This podcast should be construed as market commentary, merely observing economic, political, and market conditions, and is not intended to refer or to endorse any particular trading system, strategy, or recommendation. We're not responsible for any trading decisions taken by anyone, especially those not intended to listen. Information is not guaranteed to be accurate. This is not an offer to buy or sell any derivative. Today is April 11th. And Andy, uh, do you want to talk about your, you're now doing a podcast once a week? Is that right? We are, Jim. We're doing weekly podcasts. And of course, uh, this, monthly, this monthly podcast. And uh, we're, we're also sprinkling it in with uh, some specials. If anybody wants to uh, reach me, feel free to get a hold, get a hold of me at alabo at commodityresearchgroup.com. All right, Jim, let's get going. Let's get right into this. Um, I, I was looking at the IEA uh, summary this morning, and um, they mentioned, uh, the, they used the phrase, uh, resilience of demand. Why don't, you, why don't we start off there? There's been uh, worry of, of uh, a global slowdown and, and decline in demand. What's, what's your take on that, Andy? Well, there's been persistent worry about the global slowdown and the market, uh, the oil markets have had a, a lot of hand wringing over the last uh, four to five months about, about the slowdown. And, and we just haven't yet seen it in, the, uh, in these consumption numbers. The Chinese numbers, the Indian numbers have come in uh, pretty strong. Uh, U.S. numbers were, were good, again, in the first quarter relative to a very high baseline last year. And the, and the three agencies, which all released their reports uh, this week, the EIA, IEA, and OPEC, uh, made no changes really on their, uh, on their demand forecasts. Uh, however, uh, the IEA today did warn that, that uh, demand could slow down and uh, one area where, where it looks like it's um, trailing is, is in Europe, which uh, is, is really not all that surprising. But, you know, for, for all our fear about uh, demand really being crushed, it, it hasn't taken place yet. So the, uh, the IMF has uh, shaved, uh, I, think, I think it was like two-tenths off their two, 2019 uh, GDP numbers plus, to uh, plus 3.3. Um, I think they see it, uh, you know, Turkey, Argentina, other, other uh, uh, things taking it down. And, um, but the second half of the year, I think they have it sort of moving up again. I wouldn't call it accelerating, but they have a 3.6% growth for next year. And, and so you're, uh, you're not changing your and, – and prices are higher. So you're not changing your right prices are higher. I, I think we did shave ours uh, by about a hundred thousand uh, a couple of months ago, and I think that's about right. I, I think demand is uh, you know may, maybe there's a hundred thousand hundred thousand loss based on based on those particular numbers. But um, you know again uh, the the um, actual disappearance numbers the are, are yet to support that, but uh, I think down a hundred thousand is probably, you know, growth of of I, I, we were at like one point four, and you know we went down to one point three, Jim. But we're still we're still looking at a pretty healthy growth for next year, right? Which uh, for twenty for 2019. 2019, yeah. yeah. And and so let's why don't we just slip right into supply, which is always uh, huh. uh, uh, difficult, but um. Let's let's talk about OPEC. I mean, they they successfully cut barrels off the market. We've seen the market react to that. Well, let's why don't you talk about where OPEC is right now? They have uh, successfully, through um, the Saudis, reducing productions by a million barrels a day, and uh, of course the the sanctions regime placed on Iran and, and Venezuela. Uh, OPEC ha has reduced production by uh, over 2 million barrels a day from uh, its October baseline numbers. Uh, the last 
OPEC report, which is uh, important because that's what you know the the ministers tend to look at. Uh, the the report which came out yesterday had them down to 30 million barrels a day, 30.02, based on the secondary sources. Uh, they had Venezuela down to uh, you know 750. I think the the IEA had them at 850 to to 900. So so OPEC has um, voluntarily and involuntarily uh, taken a lot of barrels off, off the market. And uh, at 30 million barrels a day, uh, as the IEA pointed out, um, you know, we're, we're drawing global inventories. And uh, if, if the call on OPEC crude, if you look at the three, you know, you look at the three agencies, the call on OPEC crude in the second and third quarter, if you average them, average them is, is like 30 and a half million barrels a day, Jim. So, you know, we, we, we've got a shortfall in the, we've got a shortfall in the market and, you know, markets reflecting that in, in its, uh, in its rally here. Right. And um, we see that in, in some of the uh, flow, let's, you, you've seen the, the uh, hedge funds, the fund, fund business come in and, and they're back uh, long again. Um, why don't, why don't you comment on uh, what we're seeing there? Yeah, they're back. They're back long, but they're they're well below uh, what their capacity had been uh, earlier. You know, la- last year. Right now, uh, WTI is net long about two hundred and fifty. Brent is net long about three hundred and fifty, uh, which is say seven to one and eight to one uh, longs to short at one point. The, those have been 20 to one and the, the net length has been uh, with, you know, much higher than that. So th- there's still a lot, there's still a lot of capacity. I mean, the gross length has been over 500 for WTI, I believe is, is the, uh, is the right number right now. It's only 300. So, so Jim, there's a lot of capacity for, for longs to get to come into this market. Which, which yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I'm not sure it's as much capacity as it was last year. I mean, it, it, people got really long. I mean, I, we saw it in the, in the $100 calls. Um, and, you know, I, I've been talking about how little volume we've been seeing in the options world. I mean, if you look at, uh, if you look at March, we, we traded under 100,000 contracts a day, whereas in November, it was like 270. Now, 270 may have been a record, but um, more recently in April, we had a 200,000 lot day. And um, when you looked at the calls and puts, the, the call open interest was zero, no change. And the put open interest was up by um, almost, uh, you know, t- uh, 20,000, uh, 20, you know, it was almost 20,000 lots. So, so basically, it was a sharp up move. This was two day, a couple of days ago. Sharp up move in price, and yet it was a sort of a net zero open interest call and a plus open interest on a put. Which you know, without inter- interviewing every single trader, you don't know the motivation. But it looks like a market, an option market that was actually selling into that into that rally, as opposed to say last year when you'd see all this, you know volume on the call side would be increasing open interest. So it's, so it's a little different um, look to it. And like I said, the 200,000 uh, contracts was a, was a big volume day compared to what we've been seeing, uh, you know, all year long. So, so going forward, OPEC changed their, their date for their next meeting. Uh, why don't you talk about what, what you think's going on there? Well, they they wanted to get some more clarity on uh, the on the sanctions, and they wanted to get obviously more clarity on uh, on the price. Uh, the the waiver decision by the, the administration, which is uh, due by actually it's due in the next in the next couple of weeks. The Trump administration, of course, had had granted uh, waivers to some of the buyers of uh, Iranian crude. Uh, Iran had been exporting around 2.6 million barrels a day of crude and condensates, and uh, that's been cut to uh, about 1.1, 1.2 million barrels a day of, of uh, crude and uh, condensates. Uh, the market, uh, I think, is expecting the administration to tighten it up, but you know the administration has talked about it going to zero, uh, which I don't, you know, I, I, that'll never, I don't. 
it probably won't go to zero, but you know, they, they watch, uh, you know, they, they're obviously watching, watching the market. And I, I think that what's going to happen is they'll, they'll try to tighten up the um, waivers somewhat uh, to reduce Iranian exports, maybe by another hundred to 200,000 barrels a day to get it under uh, a million. But um, you know, the now is clearly not the time for them to go to try to not give any waivers whatsoever, you know, and, and, and move it closer to, uh, to zero because I, I don't think they're going to get any cooperation from the Saudis to, to replace those barrels, Jim. You, know, you think? I, I, I don't think they will. I mean, they, they, they did last, you know, they did right. last year, right? And it, it, you know, blew up in the Saudis' face. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I don't see that. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be a, a, a coordination between uh, um, our, this administration's uh, move on Iran versus uh, what OPEC, what uh, Saudis are going to do. They, this, um, obviously, uh, the Saudis felt that uh, these, the waivers were going to be a lot less than, than they actually were, or, or, they, or maybe zero. Yeah, yeah, I think the Saudis, yeah. definitely. I think the, you know, the Saudis were expected to be much, you know, the, the exports to be much lower because there wouldn't be you know, there wouldn't be waivers, right? And, um, you know, that, that forced them to reduce, to engineer along with the Russians, you know, the, this whole uh, production deal that they did in, uh, you know, in the fourth quarter of, uh, of last year. And, um, you know, right, right now, I, I think that they're pretty, you know, I think one thing, they're happy with the price. They probably would want the price a little higher, you know, they, they probably would, would love it to be 75 to $80 brand. Uh, you know, I think that would be, a, that would be their real, their real sweet spot. But, you know, I, I also, you know, they don't want to see it get much, I don't think they want to see it much higher because they recognize, you know, that's a boom for the, for the U S uh, U S producers. And, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be market share, you know, the, the, they're, they could lose. They could lose more market share, which they certainly don't want. Right. Um, you know, I do think, however, that if there are barrels lost, for, you know, if there are barrels lost from Libya, you know, that the Saudis would be would be willing to make to make those barrels up. But I, I don't think they're willing to make up, you know, anything else for Iran. Right. Which uh, brings us to the U.S. response. Um, what? Why don't you talk about? U.S. production. We heard uh, in a, a, a wonderful uh, conference yesterday that put on by Columbia University, we heard some interesting um, production numbers from some of the panel. Why don't you just uh, summarize what you, know, what you think and what, what you're hearing? That, I have to say, that was a, was a great conference uh, uh, on a lot of levels. Um, and, uh, you know, Jason Bordoff, that uh, you know, Columbia does does such a great. They're, they're just doing. He's just doing such a great job. And uh, Jason, if you're listening, congratulations on uh, you know a, a tremendous, tremendous uh, conference. They had you know one superstar guest after another, and, and it was it was on the record. So I'm not to tell you anything out of school. But they had um, Scott Sheffield from from Pioneer, who of course is. Uh, you know, I think known as, as Mr. Permian or the King of the Permian, and, uh, as, as most producers, Jim. Yes. How, how optimistic was he? I mean, he was talking about uh, U.S. production uh, going to 17 million barrels a day. Yes. And uh, the, the Permian going from 4 million, 4.2 million barrels a day to 8 million barrels a day. Yeah. Uh, um, as you said, Andy, he didn't say when. He didn't say when. No. But he definitely, you know, he, he's definitely <laughs> as optimistic as many as uh, as, as many producers. But he, he brought up a lot of a lot of great points. As you know, he's talking about the uh, cost efficiencies continuing to continuing to improve the technology, you know, continuing to uh, improve. And, and he, he also mentioned all the drilled but uncompleted wells that uh, he could see getting 
putting it putting into action as as uh, as, as prices move move higher. Although you know, I, don't, I don't think he said I don't think he said he was looking. I mean, last year the Permian was up almost a million barrels a day. I'm not sure he said this year it will be quite as high. No, I don't think he mentioned the number, but he, he did seem to indicate there was enough um, pipeline capacity for the uh, uh, for crude oil. So ga- natural gas obviously is a big is a big problem. They have negative uh, negative. He said, he said natural gas is free. I, know, I thought it was uh, even it's negative. Free. Yeah, I thought it was even freer than free. Yeah, Waha basis I think was uh, yeah. what, what was negative, uh, and that you know that that's clearly a big problem that that they. Uh, you know, I think are having a, a hard time, hard time solving. He also said a lot of the the growth would would have to be exported. A lot of the U.S. growth would would have to uh, would have to be exported, which yeah. is probably right. Right. Yeah. I think um, if you get a chance, check out uh, that Columbia University Energy. They they, they stream. Um, they were they were uh, filming it, and they'll put it up on their website at some point. It's worth. The whole thing is worth it if you if you can get the time to do it. But I I thoroughly enjoyed it from beginning to end. Okay, so uh, going into let's let's talk about um, I think gasoline is also you know kind of eye opening in its move higher. I mean it's it's coming from a low level. That I'm looking at the cracks, but um, you made a nice move. What's uh, what's going on with the gasoline? Gasoline is a, is a real uh, has, has been a real eye opener. Um, you know, we had we had been saying uh, over the last couple of, last couple of months, and in, in these podcasts on the weekly podcast when we discuss the uh, EIAs, we've been saying, hey, you know what? Gasoline is looking is looking better and better. In, in January, it looked like. It, it really looked like death. I mean, it was it was awful. We were in a bit, we were in a tremendous uh, surplus. Refinery margins were brutal. I mean, just uh, just brutal. The gasoline cracks were were negative, and um, re- refiners then went into turnarounds, and uh, they haven't really been able to get out of turnarounds. So there have been uh, one issue after another. So refinery runs and gasoline production has been um, really too low. Uh, and as a result, we've drawn gasoline nicely here uh, to the point where if you look at day supply, uh, currently uh, we're at 24, day, 24 and a half days supply versus the four-year average of 25.7. So incredibly, uh, gasoline has gone from big surplus into uh, looking, a lot, uh, looking a lot tighter. Uh, of course, Things are going to change as refiners do get out of turnaround, you know, as they do finally get back. Uh, but it, it's taking a, a really long time. As a matter of fact, Jim, our, our run level is about 700,000 barrels a day below last year, you know, crude runs. So uh, with, in both pad two and in, uh, and in pad three, you know, things will change as, as May and June as, as they get up to full capacity. But the good news is that now rather than you know gasoline looking going into the season in a in a big surplus it's going into the season you know uh, it's not tight but it, it actually might be because you know there's pretty good backwardation in all in all the physical markets so i guess i guess yeah we could we can even call gasoline uh we can go call gasoline tight and it's really helped the uh, refinery margins you know just looking at pad three refinery margins uh, right now, they're running in just in the last month. They're they're up four dollars a barrel in the uh, in the Gulf Coast, uh, and they're you know they're pretty good globally uh, globally as well. So that that's been a real uh, that's been a real surprise. Um, and certainly, you know, you'd have to say it, it's uh, it's bullish for now. And, and gasoline consumption's holding up. I mean, it's good. Like, yeah, it's gasoline good. consumption's holding up, although. Uh, and this is something that yeah, the, the price, the pump price has gone up 50, because gasoline and the cracks have gone up, uh, the pump price is up 50 cents a, a gallon, just the national pump price just since February. So, um, and, and that certainly is, is a number that, uh, you know, the administration pays very careful attention to. And I don't think, you know, they certainly don't want to see it all that much higher. 
what, let's uh, move right into uh, diesel. Diesel. Yeah, well, I mean, it, while gas cracks are going up, diesels remained pretty much sideways. Uh, diesel cracks came off pretty hard uh -huh. um, because the cracks have been so so high that the, the diesel product, you know, diesel production has been, you know, yields have gone gone to diesel and not to gasoline. That's going to change somewhat now with uh, these gas cracks coming coming back. Diesel still is, is at least in the U.S. Uh, we're looking at 30 days supply versus a four-year average of 36 and a half. And then day supply, of course, is uh, a handy number that a, a lot of analysts use. It, it's uh, stocks divided by uh, demand. You know, that's uh, it, it, it's a key number. I guess, Jim, it, it's sort of like wins above replacement for yeah. – uh, for for baseball or uh, what what is it in basketball? P E R player yeah. efficiency <laughs> something yeah yeah something like that. So you take one number and it gives you at least a it gives you at least an idea. Right. Uh, but but a diesel is you know it's been tight for a while. You know clearly uh, the big thing coming up and we will be talking a lot about this in uh, I think in May and June is the IMO twenty twenty. There's a change in the um, there's a change in the shipping in the bunker specs, uh, which is going to require uh, lower sulfur uh, marine fuel um, as of January 1st, 2020. It's a big, big deal. There's a lot of uh, change. There's a lot of change in refinery configuration and what the demand is going to be for certain products. Clearly, diesel demand is, is going to uh, is going to increase. Um, at the expense of uh, high sulfur fuel oil, and everybody is trying to figure out how much, what to do, and how to play it. How would and you how to play it? And you know, it doesn't. Yeah, I, I think I, I don't really looking at where, you know, where these diesel cracks are. You know, the January 2020 cracks. You know, they're, they're around where they were last year, more or less. You know, within a few dollars. So it doesn't look like, you know, I know people are trying to figure out what, you know, what the play is. It's not, it's not so certain that, that, you know, they're putting it on just now. Right. I, I mean, there, I, there's so many things that could happen. I guess if you want to buy uh, calls outright, might be a play. But then you have this, um, you know, you have OPEC policy. You have uh, the, 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 the world could be not growing or, or not, you know, slowing down by then. It's just, there's so many factors that could change the absolute price of diesel, even with this thing looming in the background. Um, I guess, as you say, the best play would be, would be a crack, right? Yeah. A crack, a crack, a spread, you know, a backward, it's not even that backward dated. So, you know, I, I wouldn't do it outright, but you know, there's probably going to be some opportunities. The, the question is, you have to really figure it out. You know, there's going to be yeah. what the blending, you know, there's going to be a lot of blending going on. You know, it's not like, oh, demand for diesel is going to go up by, you know, X hundred thousand barrels a day. May, you know, yes. maybe there'll be enough diesel to meet it, you know, or maybe it won't go up that much. Yeah. Um, and then there's just a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts. And, you know, I think as, you know, so often happens what the market thinks is going to happen doesn't. Yeah. I was just thinking the, um, when you look at the over under for the uh, UVA Texas Tech game, it was like an all time low and the game went overtime. Right. You know, it's, right. it's conventional, conventional wisdom is um, you always want to look at the play, you know, against that, I guess. Um, but it's, it's, the main thing is we're not seeing a lot of positions being taken yet out in that space to play, yeah. play this. Yeah, I think, that, I, I think that's that, – I think, you know, I'm sure people are, are beginning to build some baseload positions, but, you know, I don't – may still be too early. And, you know, there's also uncertainty over, uh, you know, so there, there are – uh, ship owners are putting in what, what's known as uh, scrubbers right. to allow them to burn uh, high sulfur fuel oil. You know, some of the ports are saying that's not going to be good. You know, we're not, we're not going to accept that. I mean, there's a lot of stuff flying around. Yeah, I, I, somebody told me a story where um, 
in in 2020, if you're a ship captain and you come into Singapore with uh, you know off, burning off spec uh, diesel, uh, you you're going to get two years in jail. And um, I, you know I don't I haven't been able to track down the story, but um, you know I, God forbid if the person's also chewing gum. Yeah, uh, right. So. You know the uh, I, I don't think you got there. The fines are pretty heavy. Right. Uh, the fines are going to be pretty oh, heavy. I, uh, I don't really know about, you know, yeah, I'm, jail not, time, but. I'm not trying to make light. It is a serious uh, uh, policy. Um, and uh, we just don't, again, we just don't see people putting positions on back there yet in a big way. Right. Um, right. Before we uh, talk about prices going forward, I just, I just uh, wanted to talk about uh, the options world. Um, you know, the, we had a 50, uh, plus fifty percent vol coming into this year. Uh, front month is now around twenty-two. That would be May. May goes off the board sixteen April. So it's kind of a it's gone before all the fireworks uh, take place. For, um, you know, with the uh, Iranian sanctions uh, should should come out early May, and then there's a ministerial, um, uh, sorry, a monitoring meeting in May. Right, and, and then the full meeting uh, June twenty-fifth. So when you when you look at this option curve, it's kind of flat. So you have twenty one twenty two percent in May, and then December is twenty three and a half. Uh, typically, it's it's backward dated because of the you know the volatility is on the front end, not so much on the back. And then when you look at the actual or realized historical volatilities, the premiums of implied over historical continue to get greater as you go out. So in the front month. Um, implied vol is three points over historical vol, which is kind of a normal uh, place to be. But when you get out to uh, June, it's six uh, vol points. Implied is over historical. And you get out to December, it's 11 points over historical. So, so it's kind of, you know, the, the, the market is, uh, it's okay to sell May options, but be careful selling June, July and out to December. Now, as I mentioned in previous podcasts, we may have lost some option sellers last year, you know, the nat- natural gas volatility and, and also the late, late move in crude. So we may have lost some option sellers for a while. Maybe that's what's going on there as well. But I just wanted to point that out. And we, we made, a, in, in uh, April 5th, we made a low of implied vol, uh, vol in May of 18, 18%. So, so the 22% we're at now is bounced off, off the lows. and. Um, We'll be tracking that as we go into the uh, into the uh, into May. Um, okay, so what what are you seeing? Uh, this is this is a tough one, but what do you where are you seeing? Uh, let's start with crude oil prices going forward. Say the next month or so. This is yeah, as you say, this is a this is a real uh, real tough call here. You know, right right now the market's off off a dollar. Uh, there, there was a story that uh, OPEC is is looking at. Perhaps increasing production in the uh, in the second half. Um, you know, if, if prices if prices move higher, you know, or or loss of, of uh, Libyan barrels, you know, that they'll they'll look at the market in May with more information uh, about the uh, about the sanctions, and then in June make a decision. You know, what what I. Most of the most of the chat coming out of the Saudis has been they want to they want to extend it, but again, you know, uh, maybe they'll extend it with with an option to increase. The Russians definitely want to uh, increase production, and of course, uh, you know, U.S. is going to be increasing production, increasing production as well. I think the market has a little more. I think it does have some upside. I think that this, you look at the balances, and at least for second quarter, you know they still look pretty tight. Uh, we're, we're not; it isn't like Venezuela is increasing production all, all that much, and and there is the risk of uh, of Libya losing barrels. And as we said, demand continues to be uh, continues to be pretty strong. So you know, I, I could see um, we're we're at sixty three, sixty four the second. You know, I, I think there's a chance for, for the market to get up to maybe 67, 68, maybe on uh, on on a reach, and, and similarly Brent to get uh, into the mid to uh, into the mid to the upper 70s. But 
you know, that's just based on the balances. There's, there's still a lot of news, a lot of news, uh, a lot of news ahead to to get through. So uh, it's a, it's you know it's a pre- it's a pretty tricky market here, Jim. Of course, and and um, gasoline and diesel going forward. Any any uh, comments on the price? I, I think in terms of cracks. I think gasoline cracks probably have a little bit more because these refiners are, are you know, I think they have, in, at least in the front end, I think refiners have, um, you know, or, or it, it's still going to be. Andy, we, uh, we just had a technical difficulty, so maybe you can continue uh, talking about uh, gas cracks going forward. I think that um, there, there's room on the upside still for gas cracks because it's taking refiners it's still going to be a few more weeks till they till they get back to uh, near 17 million barrels a day, uh, or, or ultimately they're going to go up to 17.7 million barrels a day in, later in the you know later in the summer. But in the meantime, I, th- I think there's uh, a chance for those cracks to go higher. Similarly, I think diesel may have some diesel cracks may have have some upside in the short term uh, as well. And. Um- Anything else you want to add to our uh, monthly podcast before we wrap it up? No, I think I think the market. The, there's a lot of uh, as we, as we try to talk about. There's a lot of moving parts. A lot of geopolitical moving parts between uh, you know the Saudis, Iranians, U.S., Russia, Libya. Um, it, 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 it's a really interesting market, and um, you know, obviously, I think for both. You know, for the for the traders, the economists, the geo, the the uh, politicians. Yeah, great market to follow. It's the great game. Okay, thanks, Andy LeBeau. We'll see you uh, next month. Uh, we try to get this uh, podcast out right around the time when the uh, EIA puts out their monthly short-term energy outlook. This is uh, Jim Colburn, Commodity Research Group dot com. Check us out. We're also on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, you can check us out there as well. Andy LeBeau, I'll see you next month. Okay, Jim.